Hello and welcome to the Bamber Priory podcast. Uh, Bamber Priory is a place of peace, Christian charity and vital history in the heart of Ulster. We offer this podcast as an extension of our mission. Please see our website linked in the description below and please like, share and subscribe to support our ministry. If you wish to donate to help keep the Priory alive, and a hub for the community, then you can do so from August on our new website. We offer this special uh, podcast on the arts in light of our forthcoming art exhibition at our memorable Benburb Priory Museum. We will be bringing in amazing art, uh, local artists, and offering workshops over the next two months. So in this episode of the Benburb Priory podcast, we are joined by the terrific Terry Glassby. So um, just to begin then, Terry, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that helped to form you and your love for Christ and his church? Sure. Um, I actually grew up in a Christian home, uh, attended uh, an Episcopal church from the time I was a child. And uh, over the years, I've attended other denominations, but at heart, I'm probably still an Anglican. I uh, I grew up in, a, interestingly, I grew up in a home where art was not really a priority. Uh, as a child, I never went to a classical music concert. I think the only concert I attended as a child was, uh, was Johnny Cash, which was a good one, I will say. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I didn't go to any art galleries. Um, the home I grew up in, Uh, the collection of books that we had were in a closet in the hallway and you had to actually go into the closet to get access to books. So, um, but, uh, but I did have wonderful parents who, who uh, really did teach me to uh, love Christ from a very early age. And uh, uh, at some point along my journey, as I really began to make my faith real to me, you know, that you you have to come to that point in which it's not just a set of ideas that you grew up with, but that you actually engage in a personal relationship with Christ yourself. And and when I got to that point in my life, I just wanted to learn. I wanted to learn more about it. Um, And so I began to read. And two of the authors who had a really you know, significant impact on me when I was, when I was young, were uh, C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer, both of whom were writers who put a lot of emphasis on the value of the arts. And um, so I just began to study and, and, and read and, and get interested, began to listen to good music. And, um, and I've spent, uh, the better part of my life just on a journey of of discovery of all these great gifts that God has placed within uh, the the and this creativity that God's placed within the hearts of you know men and women who who, who have a vision for the world that uh, expands my own vision for the world so marvelous and then um, what was it about the likes of Schaefer then specifically which made him so influential and how he saw the world as you just hinted at there? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is um, I still read a lot of C.S. Lewis. I I actually haven't gone back to revisit uh, Francis Schaeffer that much, but but I do know that what particularly impacted me about Schaeffer is the idea that art could reveal what a culture um, is holding to be important, um, as well as the fact that art could be a tool for uh, expressing your faith. Um, his little book, Art in the Bible, had an enormous impact on me. And, and that probably is the one book that I have revisited it numerous times over the years. Mm. And um, what then prompted some of the central concerns now that we see in your work so say the 75 masterpieces and then this more recent book uh, discovering god through the arts yes well uh, uh, in one sense they both i think arise from the same place which is 
that for me, the value of the arts isn't a theoretical or a theological reality only. It's also a very existential reality, a very personal reality, a very experiential reality. And, you know, I have just discovered by really um, uh, immersing myself in, in various art forms, that has just impacted my life in all kinds of ways. And one of those ways is that it's both helped me to draw closer to, uh, to God and also helped give me uh, more creative ways to talk about my faith, if that makes sense. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of what uh, discovering God through the arts is particularly about is, you know, we when we think about spiritual disciplines, you know, the tools that we use to grow spiritually, we, you know, we'll usually think of uh, uh, prayer and uh, meditation, maybe fasting, uh, attending church, etc. And all of those are great and good disciplines. And what I'm suggesting, perhaps heretical, in a heretical manner here, <laughs> what I'm <laughs> suggesting and what I really believe is the arts themselves can be tools for spiritual growth. That by immersing ourselves in really good and great art and literature and music and film that we actually can grow closer to God and can grow more mature as a human being. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Terry. Perfect sense, yeah. So Terry, if we can look at some of your uh, written work, uh, Discovering God Through the Arts, Mm -hmm. um, lamentably for many Christians, um, paintings, films, uh, music, and other forms of art are simply used for decoration, uh, entertaining distraction, or become false gods. Uh, but your work suggests that the arts can play a more prominent and ennobling role in the Christian life. Can you give us a brief synopsis of the book and help us understand how the arts can be tools for faith building and life-changing uh, spiritual formation for all Christians. Sure. Um, I uh, let me see if I can do this briefly. Um, mm -hmm. I I think that uh, what I'm attempting with kind of each chapter of the book is to unlock a particular part of our uh, Christian experience and how then show how the arts can help us grow in that experience. For example, um, I think the arts can help us to read the Bible uh, in a more profound way by giving us pictures and images and words that take us into the biblical stories and into the biblical narrative, and then open it up in new ways, help us to see things we'd never seen before. Um, you know, of course, the art doesn't have the authority of the scriptures themselves, but it is, um, I think you can look at art as kind of like a commentary on scripture, uh, you know, and through the ages, if, even if you just look at the book of Psalms, I, I've been doing just personally a really intensive deep dive into the Psalms lately, and I'm finding how much great music has been uh, created that draws from the Psalms, music from all, all kinds of musical forms. Um, another way that uh, it can impact us uh, is that uh, art can help us to kind of quiet ourselves and take kind of a, a, a role of, of getting us into a contemplative space where we quiet ourselves and focus and be prepared to pray, to listen to God, um, and to really have a have communion with God. And I find particularly um, a lot of great poetry does that. Uh, sometimes a particular images will help me still my soul, quiet myself before God. Um, art can be a tool for uh, uh, helping us uh, grow more empathetic. You know, art takes us, uh, art takes us inside the lives and the minds and the hearts of people. And, you know, a great novel or a great film, for example, or sometimes a song will help put us in a place where we can see the world through someone else's eyes. 
And as we do that, I think it broadens our, our own field of vision. It makes us more compassionate and it makes us more empathetic. We can feel what they're feeling. Um, and I, I, could go, I could go on and on. I think in the book, I've got like 10 different areas in which uh, art can function in this way for us. Mm, marvelous, Terry. And um, some of the people that you mentioned actually are, I share some of the same loves. So Van Gogh or uh, Bob Dylan or Terence Malick, you, you mentioned either in this book or recent uh, previous books. Could you speak to how maybe one or two of those help us to grow in the love of God and, and appreciation of the incarnation? Sure. Um, I, I mean, uh, uh, let's talk about Van Gogh, for example. Um, I, I, uh, I love the art of Vincent Van Gogh. And when I began to uh, read and uh, learn about his life, read his letters, what I found is that he was a person who grew up uh, in a home where faith was very real and very important. And really throughout his entire life, he held on to a faith in God. At some points, it didn't mean he didn't struggle. You know, knowing uh, God intimately doesn't mean sometimes life isn't still a struggle. But here was a man who is a, uh, who is a young man. Uh, he uh, did pastoral training. He became a missionary in Belgium to work with miners there. And uh, they were just so moved by uh, his love for God. And I think all the way through his work, we see a man who, um, who sees the majesty and the power and the beauty of God uh, in, in nature. I, I mean, a, a painting um, like Starry Night Starry is just um, with all the swirling skies and, and the bright stars. And down below, there's the little town where, you know, there are a few lights on. Interestingly enough, the light isn't on in the church that's there in the, in the bottom, as, as though he was looking for God more uh, in nature than he was uh, in the institutional church. So here was a man who, you know, had his own struggles with faith, but it was very real to him. Um, and, and Bob Dylan is somebody whose work has just meant a lot to me over the years. Um, interestingly, my first Bob Dylan album was his Slow Train Coming. I discovered Bob Dylan after the point in which he had um, a religious experience and, and uh, committed his life to Christ. And uh, then I went back and listened to the older music and realized that he had always had a passion for justice and that there were, and, and that he had spoke often about God and morality throughout his work. And then the work since his conversion, you know, he, he had like two or three albums that were kind of evangelistic. And then, then the work settled into just being more implicit. And I think you can find his faith in every album he's done, though now it's more like um, I'm seeing life with faith being part of my perspective, rather than just than just uh, singing about faith, which I think is one of the great things that a lot of artists do, that they don't just um, they don't just talk about faith. They talk about how we can see our lives, every area of life, through the eyes of faith. That's fascinating, Terry. Um... Uh, and, and how do you think the arts, you know, they help us to rediscover um, a sense of wonder and teach us again to pay attention? And why is this vital? I think that, um, I think it, you know, Jesus told us we should become like a child. And um, of course, there are many characteristics of a child. But one of the most defining uh, things about a child is their, their sense of curiosity, their sense of always wanting to ask questions, always wanting to learn, always want to experience life fully, always wanting to embrace life fully. And I think that the arts can teach us how to slow down, how to put aside all of our 
you know, adult, sophisticated perspectives <laughs> and just be a child again. Just make ourselves vulnerable to the world around us and let God speak to us uh, through the world that he created. Um, Psalm 119 is a, is, a, is a great place in scripture uh, uh, um, that, uh, uh, Psalm 19 uh, is a great place in scripture for uh, inviting us to, you know, look up and see the wonder of God, that, that, that it speaks of God actually communicating to us through the beauty that he's created. It's not just there for us to look at, but it's actually, it says in Psalm 19, a form of communication. God is actually communicating to us. And so, um, you know, we, we go through our lives at such a rapid pace. I mean, we're all busy, right? We've all got so much on our plates to do. And wonder is learning how to stop and really look and really listen. Um, you know, in my book, I talk about the fact that, you know, imagine for a moment that in the world there was only a single red rose. I mean, a red rose is so beautiful. Um, if you actually stop and look at that unfolding of the scar beautiful scarlet leaves, it would, it'll take your breath away. And if there was only one rose in the world, probably it would be in a museum somewhere and people would line up to go look at the rose. But God has created a world in which there are roses everywhere. I've got, I've got roses all over in my backyard. And it's easy just to neglect and to not pay attention. And wonder <clears throat> teaches us that we need to pay attention to the gifts that God has given to us because there is beauty and there is a sense even of holiness in the most ordinary things in the world. Yeah, that's magnificent. Thank you, Terry. And um, you hinted at it with your garden there, but can you speak a little bit more to how this has taken shape in your own life and cultivated that wonder for you? Um, for me, uh, one of the ways there, there are basically two ways um, that I um, that I look for experiencing wonder. Now, sometimes wonder just sneaks up behind you and taps you on the shoulder, and you turn <laughs> around and whoa, you there it is. But really, like anything else in life, you need to sometimes make the effort to chase after it, to search it out, right? And I find that I find it oftentimes in art. When I'll go to an art museum, sometimes I will come upon a painting that will absolutely take my breath away. And, and, it, and it has an effect on me that I really can't even explain. It's just so, but it's so profound. Um, sometimes a poem um, like uh, from Gerard Manley Hopkins or T.S. Eliot, um, a line will absolutely slay me. Uh, I'll, it'll just stop me in my tracks and I'll feel that sense of wonder. That, and, and the sense of wonder that this world is bigger and more beautiful and more meaningful than all the secularism around us would have us believe. Um, and the other way I think is through um, nature. And uh, I, I'll, I make it uh, a practice to often get away and take a wander in the woods, or even sometimes just a walk around my own neighborhood. And I just learn, I'm learning to pay attention to see the things that I might ordinarily miss and let God speak to me through them. And sometimes he brings me comfort and sometimes he brings me a challenge. Most often, I just feel the sense of when I come face to face with beauty or majesty, like for example, the um, standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, that I'm enveloped in God's love. That the person who made all this beauty and in intricacy is someone who loves me. 
Um, in fact, someone who loved me enough that he was willing to die for me. That's very uh, fascinating, Terry. And um, I just want to know how the, the arts help us dig for a deeper meaning at a time when uh, shallowness and reductionism seem to be encouraged by the dominant culture, uh, whether by politics, uh, consumerism, or other major forces. Yeah, I mean, I think we, um, is it new? I don't know. Is it new to our modern world or has it always been the case that for the most part, uh, we, we, uh, we go through life without paying much attention? I mean, Socrates said, you know, the unexamined life is not worth living. And we don't examine our lives. We just stumble along through them. And what I think art does is it sometimes, and when I say art, I'm talking about both visual art and, and, and film and uh, uh, music, whatever. It kind of stops and puts a frame around a moment to let us really look at that and really pay attention and see what we can learn. I mean, I, I think sometimes that there's so much about God that can be learned from the smallest thing that we'll pay attention to. Um, and it is a counter narrative, you know? We live in a world which says, you know, largely, you know, we are, we fell backwards into existence. We, our life doesn't really have any meaning. Everything is really the product of chance. And the scriptural, view is that our lives have incredible meaning and not only do our lives have incredible meaning but everything god created has meaning and that beauty itself is um beauty itself is a sign of meaning that that tree which takes my breath away is not only it's not only just uh something which happened to grow out of the soil and uh, and we can describe it in terms of its chemical makeup and the, the texture of its bark and whatnot. No, no, it's more than that. It's a sign, you know? It's, uh, uh, the, the, I think in a sense, the whole world is, if, if we wanna use the term sacramental, you know, the world is full of, of symbols that show us the deeper meaning of everything around us. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Terry. And you hinted at it there. How do the arts help us to deal with emotions uh, without becoming, I suppose, what the philosophers might call emotivist or subjectivist? And um, I guess that we're as if we're just uh, um, projecting that onto the universe that actually is in our relationship to God. So. Yeah, I mean, once again, our emotions are something that most people just take for granted. I have emotions and it's hard for me to deal with them. I'll just live and come whatever, come what may, you know? And the scripture tells us that through the Holy Spirit, we actually can be empowered to learn to not have our emotions control us, but learn to have some control over our emotions. Um, and, and that, the, that, the, uh, that our emotions, that awakening that the emotions within us um, can either be dangerous. I mean, I, I, I refer oftentimes to our emotions as like a dangerous gift that God's given to us. They, they can bring us to ruin. <laughs> they really can. Or you know, the emotions can help us to live life more fully, to experience everything that's out there. And so one of the interesting things that art does, is especially a form of art that um, unfolds and takes time to experience, like, for example, the two hours you experience a film, or even more, the, you know, 10 hours that takes you to read a, a good novel. You actually get a chance to live vicariously through the eyes and life of another person. And you, you see and feel their own emotional response to the things in their life. And I think we can learn a lot from that. 
because maybe it prepares us for when when a similar situation arises in our life that that arose with a character in a novel we stop and we say wow um do how 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 should i respond to this what is a healthy way what might be a bad way to respond and so um the idea is i think that art art lets us flex our emotional muscles because art is so much about our rem our emotional responses and when we use those muscles we can learn to use those muscles wisely yeah excellent thank you terry and what then have you found uh, most comforting about the arts and how can they help us to discover a courage to live by yeah, I, you know, it, life is difficult. Um, as the uh, great philosopher Woody Allen said, <laughs> <laughs> life is not for the squeamish. And, and, and there's a sense in which there is so much that's, that's painful uh, in our lives. And yet art can bring a message of hope and a message of meaningfulness into the difficulties we face. If, if there is no meaning to life, the current struggles I'm going through um, may feel like they're it. That is what life is. But the, the arts, especially art produced uh, by fellow Christians, uh, can help us get a glimmer of the hope that resides within the gospel that uh and, and i think the best art gets down struggles with the difficulties of life and then gives us some hope to help us get through those difficulties i i, I think about how the psalms so many of the psalms start out with the psalmist um, basically whining and complaining about how difficult his life is everybody's against him where are you, God? You know, there's just a lot of pain and anguish. But oftentimes, most of the time, by the end of that psalm, there's a feeling of trust. There's a decision to place his life back in the hands of the God who he has learned he can trust. And I think just as just that uh, particular um, uh, that particular path that we see in so many of the psalms. I think it's is is the path of so many works of art. Um, you mentioned earlier how much you like Terrence Malick, who's a, a filmmaker who I I so so love his work, especially uh, the Tree of Life, which is probably my my all time favorite film. And that's a film about a family who's going through the most difficult kind of pain you can imagine: losing a child. Uh, it's about uh, the other, the surviving child struggling to find an identity and a place in the world and deal with all their adolescent anger and anguish. So there's a lot of pain in that film. But at the end of the film, there is a, 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 there's one of, I think, the most beautiful um, pictures of what heaven might be like that I've ever seen, where the whole family is gathered together on a beach uh, as the sun rises or, or goes down, I, I can't remember which, and they're all embracing one another and being embraced by other friends and that this is the place where God has brought them to make the ultimate healing occur. Mm. And Terry, um... You point out that art assists us in making us more empathetic, uh, which again seems vital uh, at a time of popular narcissism, uh, needless selfies and hyper reality, which cuts us off from much of real life. Uh, can you share an example or two of that? Yes, um, I think some of the most powerful uh, examples I could share would be uh, films. Um, Robert, uh, Roger Ebert, the great film critic, uh, once said that, uh, that film is a machine for, that creates empathy. Uh, and I think that, I think it's true because when you live inside someone else's life for a period of time, 
you'll never again see life only through your own eyes. Um, <clears throat> in Experiment and Criticism, C.S. Lewis wrote about the fact that he wanted to see the world through not just his own eyes, but a myriad of eyes so that he could experience more of life. And as you experience life through the eyes of other people, you find yourself um, building more empathy. You understand, you know, it's not sympathy. Uh, sympathy means I feel sorry for a person. Empathy means I actually can emotionally identify with what you're going through. And, and I think of uh, just off the top of my head, a film I saw a, a while back called Loving, which was about the first, inter, uh, the first interracial couple in the United States who, who fought to, um, who, who went through the court process to allow them to have the relationship um, together. And, you know, you could make all kinds of arguments about why, uh, why um, interracial marriage is just fine, there's no problem with it, uh, but that is all working on the abstract. When you actually get into the lives of these people and what they experienced and what they had to go through um, in their pursuit of just being able to love one another as man and wife, um, it totally changes the way, then it's not an abstraction, it's a reality. And I think in a time, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we talk, uh, we're talking a lot these days, um, especially in the United States, but I think all over the world about racial issues. And I mean, by getting inside the lives of somebody very different from you, who has a different background uh, and a different set of experiences that have made them who they are, you change. Uh, it changes you. It, it um, to use a phrase from the, uh, the great TV show, The Simpsons, it embiggens you. <laughs> you know, it, it, it makes you bigger inside. Um, and so particularly uh, novels and films have really, um, have really done that to me. And I would challenge people to, you know, uh, take the time to read a novel or watch a film that's from a culture or a subculture that is not part of your normal culture so that you can kind of learn what other people struggle with. And I think it, 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 it as I said, it embiggens us. It makes us bigger insight. It gives us a wider perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Terry. And um, you, you you really bring across how arts have that power to uh, prophesy and this prophetic quality. I want to ask a, 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 how they awaken that passion for justice. Are there any other examples that uh, really sp spoke to your heart that you'd like to tell us about, apart from that one that you just uh, referenced there? Yeah, um, I, I, I think of, for example, Bob Dylan. And how much Bob Dylan's music um, through two different ways has, has really helped me to understand um, uh, the world around me better in terms of, of, of the, the need for social justice. A lot of Bob's uh, earlier music, um, uh, he called it his finger pointing music, <laughs> but he but he pointed his finger so beautifully about helping us to see um, that uh, um, that there isn't so much injustice in the world. I think of the song, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll. Uh, and it's a song about uh, uh, an African-American woman who uh, is killed really for no good reason uh, by a gentleman who's just inconvenienced by her. And he goes, Bob Dylan goes through the whole, telling that whole story. Um, and it ends with finding out he gets a six month sentence for killing a woman just because he happened to be in a bad mood and she was in his way. And so this kind of storytelling opens it up, opens things up to us. Um, and the other way is maybe is to step back and look, uh, there's a Bob Dylan song called With God on Our Side. 
which is a, a classic Dylan uh, track that uh, is kind of about how we all try to think that God is part of our particular set of uh, priorities, that God, uh, you know, whether it be America or Ireland or Britain or whoever, God, God's really on our side. And uh, it's a song helping us to think about the fact that um, God is bigger than any of our nation states. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's like, that's like one example. I, I think that um, the biblical prophets did such a powerful job of calling God's people to account for their failings, for their neglect of the poor, for their neglect of widows and orphans, uh, for their, uh, sometimes for their absolute injustice um, when it came to uh, the rich taking advantage of the poor. And uh, I think it's sad that there's not a lot of Christian art these days that, that's doing what the prophets did, which is calling us to say, hey, wake up and see that um, God loves, God loves all of his children and God wants to see justice. Um, God, God is on the side of the least of these. So. And Terry, what is the role of the arts in, in creating a quiet place and assisting us in prayer and contemplation? Well, it, you know, the, the interesting thing is historically, when you think about it, the church has always seen that as, as, as a priority from fairly early on. I mean, even in the Roman catacombs, the, uh, the, some anonymous artists, we don't know who they are today, but they, they painted scenes from the Bible so that when people, uh, uh, when people were uh, there gathered together, they would they would have the witness to those biblical stories and as the, as our churches developed you know we've used everything from stained glass to you know uh hymns and uh glorious organ music um we've used paintings in the um uh or in the orthodox tradition they've excuse me they've used icons all of these, all of these are tools to get us to stop, pay attention, and the way we pay attention is by quieting ourselves and listening and uh, getting our hearts ready for communion with God, for, uh, for prayer that uh, gets a little deeper than just uh, um, just uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer, but that actually gets us into thinking about our own life and the things that we need uh, to be praying about. Um, I think it's uh, like, as I said earlier, poetry does the same thing for me. Oftentimes it can help me just quiet myself and, and prepare myself for prayer. I think that is the one, one thing about prayer is we don't think about prayer as work. One of the lovely things about the monastic tradition is they understand that prayer is work. And if you're going to do work, you have to prepare. You have to, uh, you know, uh, you have to get your tools together uh, if you're going to do the work that needs to be done. And in a certain sense, I think the arts can help us get the tools together and give us kind of a point of focus to get us started in prayer and, and, and contemplation and, and meditation. Wonderful. Thank you, Terry. And um, besides this book, you've written another magnificent book encouraging us to discover different 75 artistic masterpieces. Can you share a few pieces of art that have um, stayed with you over the years and tell us a little bit about the soul food that you commend for our spiritual journey in, the, in this book? Sure. Um, uh, one example might be uh, Rembrandt's painting, uh, The Prodigal Son. Um, a, a painting that captures that biblical story um, in in such a powerful way. And uh, if you if you if you don't know it, um, you might want to push pause and go look at it. 
um, because uh, it, it's a picture that captures the love of God for us through uh, the father who uh, lays his hands gently upon the shoulders of the son who is asking for forgiveness um, and trying to return the relationship after, after his prodigality. <laughs> you know, he, he's coming back and he's warmly and fully accepted, a message that we, um, that we all need. Um, and, and I think about uh, I think about how how a lot of classical music um, has has had a kind of an impact. One of the pieces that I um, that I share in the book uh, is uh, Handel's Messiah, which is a wonderful piece that unfortunately we sometimes relegate to only listening to during the Christmas season, but it's really uh, for all time. And what's interesting about the about Handel's Messiah is it's not really telling the story of Jesus only. It does some of that, but mostly it's talking about the significance of the story of Jesus. And you know, if you could ever, if you ever want a wonderful experience, go open your Bible and next to the text of the Messiah. And um see how much of it, virtually all of it, is drawn directly from scripture. It's basically scripture set to music and, and is such a powerful piece. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I could talk about uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, The Four Quartets, which is uh, a, a collection of poems that uh, whenever I'm really in need of, of some spiritual nourishment, it's oftentimes one of the books I'll grab and take with me and go go somewhere where I can find some quiet and I'll just read and meditate on those uh, magnificent poems um, or C.S. Lewis, almost anything by C.S. Lewis. But uh, for example, the Chronicles of Narnia, which I talk about in the book. Um, I, I, I teasingly say, but I think I'm, I think it's not far from true that the, the Chronicles of Narnia might be the greatest theological work of the 20th century. Because what it does is it embodies theology. It makes theology come to life. It takes what was an abstraction and just makes it that much more real to us, which is one of the amazing things that art can do for us. You know, um, art, I like to say that sometimes art comes with, to us with a message, with a very clear message. And it does sometimes. And that's great. Oftentimes, though, what art does is it evokes the right questions. It, it's, it, it tells us just enough to get us to stop and wrestle with the, some of the questions about what's important in life. And when we wrestle, God is present there with us in our wrestling. I really believe that that's the case. Harry, thank you so much for us. <laughs> Terry, thank you so much for that and thank you for joining us today on the podcast. We appreciate it. And um, we appreciate everybody at home that is uh, watching and subscribing. So Terry, where can uh, viewers get the latest book and follow you in your work? Yes, um, I have a website, uh, which is terryglasby.com. Uh, T-E-R-R-Y-G-L-A-S-P-E-Y. So that's one place you can look. Um, you can buy the books there, uh, but you can also buy uh, my books um, uh, at, from, you know, whatever your favorite internet retailer is, whether it's amazon.com or, or maybe one of the smaller ones who uh, they also need your, your support. Um, or your local bookstore can will either have it or can order it. Should be widely they should be widely available. And um, on my uh, on my website, I don't uh, blog as often as I should. I'll go through phases, but uh, um, but I do uh, love to sometimes post things that I'm responding to there. 
Again, anyone watching at home, remember to like, to share and subscribe in order to support Ben Bear Prairie. And from August onwards, then you will be able to donate if you wish. And you can give us a visit in person, of course, availing from Servite Hospitality or Museum or Library, beautiful castle in Valley Park. And hopefully we'll see you at Ben Burb someday, Terry. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, I'd love to visit. <laughs> God bless you.